is now 6 p.m. and I will call to order the August 14, 2018 meeting of the MISD Board of Trustees. If you would first, uh, we will first engage in a moment of silence, please, and then a pledge to the U.S. flag and Texas flags. But before doing so, I'd like to introduce you to the student who will lead us in those pledges. That student is Lee High School junior Krista Carrasco. Krista is the personnel officer for Lee High Air Force Junior ROTC. Krista participates in the Kitty Hawk Air Society and is also an active member of the Lee High School Orchestra where she plays the viola. More recently, Krista and the Lee High School Top Orchestra came home with the Sweepstakes Award, the highest award available at UIL competition. Krista has earned two academic letters and a letter jacket as a sophomore maintaining a high A average. She has been inducted into the National Junior Honor Society and has also received the President's Education Award for outstanding academic excellence. Krista plans on going to college to receive a degree in criminal justice and then enter the Air Force after she graduates from Lee High School. You'll first, though, join me in a moment of silence and then we'll be led by Cadet Krista Carrasco. Thank you. Ms. Carrasco? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, Cadet Carrasco. Good luck to you. All right. Item, agenda item number three, announcements. Mr. Riddick. Board, I just want to share with our community, as well as with you, that you've heard um, several times the work that our team did in regards to launching into the school year. Appreciate all the work that our team members have done with our teaching and learning opportunity that we announced as Elevate. I'm proud of the work that our Executive Director of Professional Development, uh, Jill Rivera, uh, did in that work and her team members, uh, some present tonight, that um, launched and put countless hours into that to make it an incredible two days for our teachers at Lee High School to go through their professional development. To our opportunity to gather for one last convening with convocation. So kudos to that team and to that work. As well, for our community to be represented with the Lieutenant Governor, as I was invited with 19 other superintendents from around the state to sit with him for several hours to talk through two important topics that will be agenda items that he will present during this legislative session, uh, one being school safety and the other being school finance. We were able to sit in dialogue and get to learn both sides from he, from superintendents and us from the Lieutenant Governor in order to work and partner forward for what could come into this next legislative session. So there'll be more convenings that will occur and proud to be part of that team that got time to spend with him. Thank you, Mr. Riddick. And then uh, we'd like to echo the congratulations to the pre-start of the school year. I've heard lots of positive feedback and congratulations to Ms. Rivera and all the folks that played such an important part of that. I've heard <coughs> Nothing but glowing remarks and a lot of excitement for the school year. Thank you very much. All right, we now turn to public forum. We have a number of speakers who have signed up to address the board this evening. In no particular order, but I will start with uh, Chris Gafford. He's, his topic is political correctness and MISD stats. Mr. Gafford, welcome. Thank you. Um, just one year now I've been coming up here since my first trip here one year since Mr. Riddick started. Um, since then, we've had uh, one high school principal who overreacted to one song that was played for 56 years, even though there were zero was the number of students endangered by Dixie. 
I'm wondering why you're sitting with the lieutenant governor if you mentioned to him that we're cutting out songs to make things safer while you're talking about school safety. But we have had at least three guns taken off MISD campuses, at least two elementary kids sexually assaulted in the classroom, elementary kids. We've had two teachers at Goddard fired for inappropriate behavior. We've had a crossing guard arrested for sexual assault. During all that time, we've had one superintendent who, despite what he says, is the opposite of transparent, which has led to, in the past year, 488 professional positions uh, terminated through either resignation or retirements. 488 people y'all lost this year. 700 plus signatures calling for Mr. Riddick's uh, resignation. That's not a couple of people. That's a lot of people. Countless children moving to um, charter schools and homeschool, including my youngest son. We have one school board president. Mr. Davis, you should have been removed from your position for your blatantly sexist comments um, during, during one of the, the meetings that you had um, with Ms. Linscombe. You have a complete lack of passion uh, for the emotionally destroyed kids, mothers, and families who have shared their stories and struggles. You're not fit to serve in that position. Zero is the number of times that this board has allowed a fair discussion about Dixie or any other serious issues, like I've brought up several times, the Guardian program or real ways to keep our kids safe. 26,000, that's the number of students y'all are failing. Tens of thousands is the number of taxpayers who deserve better. Now I understand, Mr. Riddick, this is a very dynamic district with many different challenging aspects. We don't expect y'all to be perfect, but we do expect you to listen. And we expect whenever we bring something to you as our elected representatives that somebody listen. Mr. Bishop listens. He hears us. The rest of y'all, I don't know if I could say the same. It's time for you to listen to the people that come up here and have three measly minutes to say their piece. Because as it is right now, you're not here to think. All right, thank you, Mr. Gaffer. Next, uh, Mr. McAvee, do you wish to address the board? To the board, superintendent, and to the audience. I just want to say that I have been greatly charged and emotionally uplifted over the past few days. In fact, I was so charged after watching a snippet of the convocation that I almost reached and got my telephone and dialed in, asked if I could come back and teach. However, my sciatic nerve told me, no, you don't want to do that. <clears throat> so I didn't do that. But to stand here and I'll sit here and watch those young people who walk across those stages, of this particular stages, uh, approximately 30 minutes ago within that particular time frame, it really emotionally uplifted me because it showed me that young people still with proper guidance and inspiration will be steadfast and unmovable in their quest to achieve the American dream. And I'm just so proud of those particular young people uh, doing that. And I'm also proud of this particular community because over the past few weeks I've sat back and watched uh, reports in the Midland Telegram, reporter telegram, especially one, in that the county commissioners here thought so much of this particular district and this particular leadership that's in place now. They donated some, I'm not sure, I don't want to be in uh, error, but multi-million dollars. Five for, million. Five million, yes sir. I, I, I was just so elated by that. And then yesterday, just sitting at home, uh, mostly attending to my sciatic nerve, I had the pleasure of seeing one of the company, or uh, maybe it was a trio of companies that got together and went to South Elementary and took uh, approximately 400 uh, school packs to the young people to get the year started. That is so amazing because people who have don't realize the challenge that it is for people who have not to come prepared on the first day of school and have supplies and things that you need to get the year started. So I'm, I'm just uplifted. Keep doing what you're doing. 
All right, thank you, Mr. McAfee. Next, Jennifer Carpenter. Ms. Carpenter, welcome. Your topic is thank you. That's a nice topic. Um, I, just good evening, I just wanted to, I wasn't planning on speaking tonight. I came in, uh, I might get emotional about this because I've been really passionate. I think y'all are aware, you know, mm. that the teachers in our district deserve so much. And I just wanted to say thank you to the, those of you that did respond to my email about what the exit interviews that I um, conducted and what they came up with and the answers that I did receive. Um, I'm sorry, I'm saying um because I just wasn't prepared. I, I appreciate, I had two board members that reached out immediately with my response, Mr. Bishop and Mr. Murray. I'm so grateful that you took the time to message me to say that you received it and that you wanted to go over it. It was a very long email. There were a lot of answers and I know that took a lot of time out of y'all's schedule to read and really absorb the answers that were in those responses because they hurt me to read repeatedly as I typed them up for you guys. And Mr. Davis, you did respond to me and I do appreciate that. I appreciate the fact that y'all took the time to say thank you for the effort that I put in, but that's not why I did it. I did it to to just share that we knew what was going on. And I just, I appreciate that y'all are considering the actions that I suggested moving forward. You know, I know that we already have an action in, in movement with the ex, with like an exit interview for the staff as they leave, if they resign online. And I think that's a great step forward. I know Mr. Bishop and Mr. Murray were very cooperative and like moving forward to hopefully get some checks and balances in place, I guess, on campuses to help teachers have a voice on their campus and not be in fear of any kind of retribution. So I just wanted to say thank you because I feel like we need a little more positivity and not so much negativity all the time that I feel like we do have a couple of pegs in the right places that are really trying to make the right choices for our district. And I do appreciate the time and effort that they all put in and thank you for, thank you for those that responded to me. I do appreciate that. All right, thank you, Ms. Carpenter. All right, next up, Leslie Curtis. Uh, topic is special needs students. Welcome, Ms. Curtis. I would just like to update you on my son. I came here two months ago to tell the board that I was the one who had the special needs student who was seen videotaped in distress, curled up in the ball while the paraprofessional moved him with her foot along the floor like a piece of trash while she was staring at her cell phone all the while with the supervisor, supervising teacher also staring at her cell phone. Since that time, I've had numerous meetings. Believe it or not, I'm gonna thank you too. I'm gonna thank Don Miller and Jeff Horner and especially Laura Arthur. This woman is incredible. She's a saint. She has been working diligently to help my son. I do, however, want to bring out something. Mr. Riddick, in your interview with Jay Hendricks, you said you wanted the hard questions. You wouldn't shy away from them. This is my question. Yes, that aide was removed from the room. Do you know where she is now? She's the face of Midland High School. She's sitting at the front desk. The woman that treated my child like a piece of trash, my child that can't speak for himself, is now at the front desk at Midland High. I was told last week that I now have an appointed assistant principal that I can go to, which I'm very appreciative of, but that I didn't need to go to the office. I don't think that's right. I don't think because you're leaving that employee in that office that I should avoid that. My son can't speak up as I told you that before, but I can. I'm gonna to continue to fight this battle, despite the wonderful things that Mr. Horner's done, Laura Arthur, and Don Miller. I'm gonna to continue to fight. I'm not gonna give up, Mr. Riddick. I've contacted the U.S. Office of Civil Rights. I did not sign the resolution. I've contacted TEA with the teachers and aides that I'm in question about, and I just wanted the board to know I will not give up this fight. If that's the kind of representation you want of your high school, then you really need to rethink this. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Curtis. All right, next, Pastor Barack Stanford. 
There's no topic listed, but Mr. Stanford, welcome. Good evening. Good evening. To the board, Mr. Riddick. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address you. Uh, I'm here with uh, a recently formed group by the name of support education. <laughs> and we do support education. And along with that, I feel that you as a board deserve our support as well. I know your jobs are difficult. I know you have a lot on your plate. I know you have a lot going on. So with that being said, I would like to place on your hearts and on your minds uh, the fact that in our education system, in our curriculum, there's nothing to educate our students as far as black history is concerned, other than perhaps once a year during Black History Month. I would like to see something put on uh, the curriculum to enhance the education as far as black history is concerned so that all of our students, not only black, but black, white, red, yellow, green, can know the history of this country, know the history of how uh, the struggle and what the contributions to this country were made by African Americans. So thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mr. Stanford. And I. I say no particular order, but I do try to lump the speakers together. Uh, Ms. Kirk, are you also, are you on that same topic or a different one? I, I've got two others I know that are on that topic, so let me, let me come back to you, uh, or at least it looks like they are. Uh, next, let me ask Akila Watson. Her topic is support education. Ms. Watson, welcome. I would like to thank the uh, board members for the opportunity to be able to come and speak this evening in support of education. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Aquila Watson. I reside at 443 Palmer Drive, Midland, Texas. I speak in behalf of support uh, education and every parent, teacher, and human being that would want to treat others the way they would want to be treated. Uh, the self, uh, in support of our school board, superintendent, staff, and the teachers who are working so hard to get our children educated, uh, to learn to be better citizens and lead our community and around the world. I recognize the fact that our children are our responsibility as parents to raise them, to teach them the way that they should treat others before they have to come to the school to be taught how to do it. The teachers have a hard enough time just trying to get their curriculum through. And uh, our first uh, start at home, and let me follow my notes, that we as parents teach our children to learn unless we lead them to TV shows uh, full of violence, rage, and they begin to act out in what they see. So we don't want our children to be raised by violence and TV shows and things uh, that will cause them to be anything other than upstanding citizens. So for the parents, if we would take control of our children at home and begin to teach our children right from wrong, we might not be faced with so much bullying and so much uh, hatred that is being projected in our schools today. And also, um, I would like to know if there are positions on the board uh, where uh, bullying is concerned, and what would your uh, criteria be to be able to serve on that board and if there are spots available? 
Mr. Brady. I'll have a team member get with you. Her name is Ms. Teresa Moore, and she'll touch base with you just shortly after you sit down. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Watson. Next, uh, Shirley Howard, Topic Support for Education. Ms. Howard, welcome. Good evening. Giving honor to God and recognizing the rest of you, my name is Shirley Howard. I'm here on behalf uh, the, as the organizer of the community support, supporting education. And we came together because we wanted to support MISD. I want to say thank you all for coming out to the meeting a couple of weeks ago. We appreciate your appearance and we appreciate your input. However, there are some questions that the community want some answers to. I know some things you cannot address here tonight, but we appreciate you um, addressing them by email or whichever way if you cannot answer them tonight. We know bullying come in many forms, and it's not just up on children. It happens to adults as well. However, we're saying, Mr. Reddick, why are you being bullied to the fact that a group has come together and called for your resignation? However, on that same note, in speaking with the representative for mom, she informed me highly that your resignation call have not been rescinded, which this group of, in this community had believed the paper that it had been. Because we steadfast and support the initiative that you and your team have put together for this coming year. You've only been here a year. You've done a great job in our eyesight. However, the community is very disturbed. Not only black, we're talking brown, black, and white. They feel you have done a wonderful job. I heard the gentleman earlier to give you negative bond. That's okay, everybody have the right to their opinion. But that is one of the important questions that we need an answer to, to help us move forward. Okay, thank you. All right, Ms. Howard, thank you. All right, Ms. Kirk, I come back to you. I'm sorry for the start and stop. Heidi Kirk, uh, topic, support for positive change. Ms. Kirk, welcome. First, I want to just thank you all for allowing me this time to speak. Um, and so good evening. Thank you to all of you who are here, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Riddick, and community members. My name is Heidi Kirk. I have six children. Yes, I did say six, and yes, they are all mine. Three of them are still currently attending MISD schools. As a parent, community member, and former educator with the district, I feel the need to speak up about recent events in our community, not as part of a specific group but as a community member. I speak today on behalf of myself and many other parents in the community who are concerned about the state of affairs in our district, who are concerned about things that have been said and not said, done and not done, by both the district and the community. We're concerned. We believe our district needs to strive for change and we still believe working together with our district leaders is an option and it's an important plan of action. I personally am committed to being a part of that plan of action, which is why I'm here. As a mother of six very different children with very different needs, ranging from high-functioning autism to GT, I want to say I support the direction the district is headed. This past year, I have had the benefit of participating in multiple district committees, and I see positive changes taking place. I see a system of great schools taking form and a district of innovation plans being implemented. And I see a superintendent, superintendent and district staff who are human beings and a board that are human beings just like me, who deserve grace, respect, and an opportunity to show us what they are made of. I know there are many in our community who question the district's future, and with good reason. It is obvious from the Katamba survey, the teacher survey, and the publicly voiced parental concerns that we have a lot of work ahead of us but I truly believe we are headed in the right direction. 
Over the last 12 months, I saw teachers, students, community members, administrators, and central office staff come together to explore innovative ways of meeting student needs. I saw a call for people in and out of our community to propose entire schools focused on meeting those needs of our diverse student population. I saw Elise Kale notice a look during a meeting and take the time to ask for feedback about what teachers and the community saw that the administration may not. I saw Woodrow Bailey take time from his current hiring frenzy, and we know that that's important on our agenda, to meet with a concerned parent who had feedback on how we can improve the quality of life for our teachers. Because as a former teacher, it's a concern. And most recently, I saw Mr. Riddick eat ice cream with his wife and take time to greet people that he recognized despite public criticism of his performance. Thank you. I could continue about the wonderful things I've witnessed over the last year, but my friends were sure to remind me that I only have three minutes. I might be close to that. If you ask those that know me, education is a topic very dear to my heart. I may never stop talking if you give me the time to do it, but I digress. Instead, I will bring my time to almost an end by saying I call on the community, whether or not they have a child in our schools, to take time and invest in the changes our district is making by participating in committees and serving on PTAs. Make your voice heard by being a catalyst for change. Be a force for good for our kids and set a positive example about how to bring change to the world they live in. Commit to being part of the positive plan of action. And finally, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Riddick, there are many mothers, fathers, grandparents, and community members, many of which are in here and many who are not, who demand to see change and still support the direction we are headed. We do not need resignations or token gestures. We need solid changes to transform our district into one we can be proud of. We call on you to not only stay the course, but to increase efforts to eliminate bullying in our school, to improve work conditions for teachers and other staff members who make a positive difference in the lives of our kids, and to continue to reinvent what education looks like in Midland, in Texas, and in our country, because we're part of that with our system of great schools. We are here to work with you to drive the change the district so desperately needs. Tell us what you need so we can help. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kirk. All right, next up, I think we have uh, possibly two speakers have lined up, Elizabeth Dice and Mai Singh, I'm not sure. Topic, I believe, is daughter safety. I apologize for pronunciation. What is your name, sir? It's Nimai. Nimai. All right, Mr. Nimai, sorry. Uh, Welcome. It's fine. I've had it all my life. Um, I mean, I'm not really sure what to say right now. Not that I'm a loss for words or anything like that. It's after hearing this gentleman's statement and everything like that. It's just that uh, I'm not even sure if what I'm saying here would be reached or make it past this room. He spoke that, you know, there was two incidents this year where it was elementary schools that was sexually assaulted in the classroom, one being my daughter. And uh, so far, everything that has happened, uh, nothing's really been taking place. It was, for lack of better words, it's been getting swept under the rug. I was told that her case got slipped through a crack. If it wasn't for that and the outreach of the public, that nothing would have been done. Now, I'm standing here like, I'm, I don't even know if I can believe anything that will be happening after here if it, anything would be more into the future if it would be looked at not only for my daughter but for the children that it happened to before or even in future cases if it does happen. I mean, it says it in your name, Board of Trustees, but the last thing I have is trust. I haven't been in this Midland for a long time, but so far, I mean, I don't know any of you or anything of your background, but so far there's nothing that I see that I can trust. Is this, I've been getting lied to, getting the runaround, and yet still nothing has been done. I'm sorry to hear that. And uh, we're not familiar with your circumstances, but we will look into it. Thank you very much. Uh, before I go, she does want to say something. Okay. And what is her name? Is there Elizabeth? No, it's Pranaya. Okay. You hear my belly, belly. Sorry. Yeah. Tell me. Hey, belly. 
Do you want to tell them? Yes, yeah. I think we don't want to. It's okay. I want to get justice for me and other little girls will happen to me and for them because they had it too. Thank you very much. All right. That concludes our public forum. Next is our consent agenda. 5A, board meeting minutes of our regular board meeting on July 16, 2018 and our special meeting and workshop on July 30, 2018. 5B is our financials. 5C is our monthly investment report. 5D, monthly expenditures. 5E, our request for proposal, bid proposals. E1 is uh, bid copy for copy paper for warehouse. Number two is special education professional services. Number three is technology services and software. Number four is dental plan administration services. Number five is third party administrator and reinsurance services. And number six is charter bus services. Each of those proposals are on pages 35 through 49 of our board packet. Also, consent item F is our 2018-2019 student handbook. 5G is our 2018-2019 student code of conduct. 5H is our teen court agreement. 5I is our personnel appointments. 5J is a board gift. And all of those matters in their totality are on pages between 10 and page 202 of our board packet. Board, are there any of these items that need to be pulled for any reason whatsoever? Hearing none, the consent items 5A through J will be deemed approved by consent. All right, next, our district reports. 6A, board goals. Information begins on page 203 of our board packet. Mr. Jones, welcome. Good evening, board members, President Davis, Vice President Bishop, trustees, Mr. Riddick, I would first uh, like to share with you um, Board Goal 3.0. <clears throat> board Goal 3.0 is specific to the four-year graduation rate will increase from 85% for the graduation uh, graduating class of 2015. This is reported in November of 2016 to 95% for the graduating class of 2020, which is reported in November 2021. Our annual target for the 17-18 school year was 89%. I am happy uh, to be here and inform you that the um, rate that we have uh, are sharing with you tonight is 89.8. We exceeded our annual target of 89%. Congratulations. Please put up the next slide so we can see it graphically displayed for us. Thank you. That's terrific. Congratulations to all. I'd like to commend the work um, done by our campuses, our campus administrators, our teachers, our central office team that works in uh, Mary Janicek and her department. Uh, the folks that help us uh, participate during the recovery walk uh, at the beginning of every school year, all of that work coming together helps us uh, reach this goal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Uh, on the, you can talk about goal progress measure 2.4 now? Yes, sir. Okay, great. At this time, I would also like to share with you uh, a goal progress measure that's specific to the uh, percentage of students in grades uh, third through eighth who score on or above grade level in reading. Uh, and we utilize uh, iStation and iEspanol um, and score proficient or advanced in math utilizing Imagine Math. Um, we are using this year as a baseline uh, year uh, for this uh, particular goal progress measure. I also want to share that the sixth through eighth grade uh, grades were new implementing iStation this year. Um, and our grades three through eight were also new to implementing Imagine Math. Uh, this was formerly Think Through Math. 
Our established baseline for 2017-18 is 44%. We will definitely need to work uh, along your side in developing a SMART goal around this particular goal progress measure because this is a baseline year. And, and is this one that would be measured at the end of the school year? Yes, sir. Okay. And do we have yet scheduled a workshop to, to deal, to address? We have, we have not. We've uh, okay. put out a few dates and conflicts that keep coming up. Oh, that's so we right. still need that's to right. establish a date for that. All right, yeah, we definitely need to uh, establish our, a date to do this. Will our approach be any different to addressing this challenge? Addressing continued professional development yeah. around the use of ice station. Really, As I mentioned before, uh, this particular uh, tool that we're utilizing, uh, sixth through eighth grade, is new, was new this coming year. So we expect that we will have more experience in, in how to utilize those tools and continue to, and we will, we will expect to see continued growth in those areas. Yes, sir. All right, any other questions for Mr. Jones about this item? We look forward to the workshop when we get that scheduled, hopefully soon. All right, thank you, Mr. Jones. Next, I think you're still up there for District Report 6B, our academic update. The information begins on page 210 of our board packet. Board members, in a um, previous update, we shared with you our forecasting around um, campuses that we felt like um, were uh, forecast to be uh, met standard, campuses that were forecast to, um, to have a challenge um, and to be close. And we also shared with you uh, one particular campus that was unlikely to make it. Um, since then, we did receive our CAT files from TEA. Um, so we're able to comb through uh, that information and do some calculations. And I am here to report that um, I know previous report uh, indicated that we forecast to have about 12 campuses that were close. We narrowed that down through internal calculations to seven. Um, but we are sitting with five IR campuses uh, moving forward for next year. Those five IR campuses are Houston, Lamar, Scarborough, Travis and Washington. Um, we also previously shared with you that, um, that our predicted rating uh, for the district would be a C rating that did come to fruition. Um, it came back one point higher than what we expected, so that will be a 73 uh, C, and this information will be going public tomorrow. I would also like to share out that um, we received 21 distinctions uh, based on the report uh, from TEA. Those camp campuses include Early College High School receiving three distinction designations, Lee Freshman receiving one distinction designation, Midland Freshman receiving two, Bonham receiving four, we're very proud of all of our campuses, but I want to specifically bring attention to Bonham. It's one of our higher economically disadvantaged campuses, and it, it comes in first. When you, when you separate Carver out of the equation, it's leading the pack in, in academic performance, <clears throat> and they are receiving four distinction designations. We're very proud of that work. And of course, the leader of that campus is now going to be at South leading the efforts at South Elementary and Juan Dominguez. So if you get a chance to pat him on the back, please do. And his team at Bonham. Bush received one distinction designation. Mr. Jones, wait, yes. I think Mr. Marquez has a question. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but um, you hadn't finished it. But, um, so are we going to get an opportunity on, here in the next board meeting to do those recognitions? I think that'll be real we important. We definitely want to recognize these accomplishments. It's really a big deal to us. It's a big deal to them, and we need to make sure that our teachers and our leaders of those campuses see that we celebrate those accomplishments. Yes, sir. Well, it's a you know, it's real important for our community to hear, hear the positive change. There's still work to be done. Um, one thing I've come to realize is that 
there's a lot of work to be done on a constant basis. It's, it's not a, um, it's an evolution process constantly. And if it's not from the, obviously the educational side, it's from the legislative side. So uh, I just commend everybody because uh, the Long Star Governance, which I have a lot of faith in, that we've worked on as, as a whole, not as a board, as a whole, as a, as a district. And I think that's, uh, that's paying a lot of rewards. Yes, sir. Carver received six distinction designations. Franks received one. Jones received one. Parker received one. And our campus that was in its, going into its sixth year as IR uh, will be met standard, and that is South. And they're also uh, receiving one distinction designation. I applaud the team at South as well, and I applaud the leadership uh, that we have now uh, hired on to run our EL department in Lithia Maya. I also want to share that, um, yes, we have five, improve, five improvement required campuses. Um, we were forecasting to have seven, and the work started as soon as we uh, conducted our own analysis of that information. So we've already met with uh, all of those identified campuses and had accountability review sessions to, to sure up the knowledge and capacity around the new accountability system. Uh, the rules were changing this past year as we were going through and we were receiving even changes and updates there toward the end in May. But now we know the rules of the game and we're going to proceed accordingly. We're also conducting root cause analysis at all of those campuses to ensure we start to peel the onion back and get to the root cause of uh, some of the challenges we're facing at those specific campuses. So all of those needs are typically unique. Uh, we will identify those and provide support around those areas as well as uh, the challenges that we face as a district across the district and make those adjustments as well. Will we get information relative to how close those five campuses may have come to avoiding being classified as IR? Yes, yes, sir. We will provide that information to you. I'd like to see that information. Yes, sir. So as an example for one of the So as an example for one of the campuses that we have, uh, there's a rule that came in late um, in the accountability manual that created what's known as a force fail. And so although the campus would have been a MET standard, but a MET standard at, if you were using the uh, language coming out of the Texas Education Agency of an A, B, C, D, or what could be qualified as an F school, it would have made a D standard. But because of where they were positioned in other areas, uh, they were, in essence, forced to fail and become an IR school. Um, in our work that Mr. Jones is talking through already, we've, we've begun some of that work, in essence, as soft launches uh, to build our progress and, and our efforts. So you'll see at Sam Houston, uh, the transition of the entire campus leading into the school year, what we're, being, what we're able to establish. You hear what that performance looks like in the previous year. The goal was what can we do in the oncoming year. We've gone to our Travis community to talk with them about the opportunity to partner with one of the stronger performing charters, uh, one of the highest performing charters in the state of Arizona, who does work in Nevada and wants to partner with us here in Texas. And they wanna be, they wanna partner with us first. So the opportunity to begin that dialogue with transitioning and innovation of partnership and, and development of what we can do with our next uh, set of campuses. We have an entire administration that's taken over one school, which is entirely disappointing to hear that that school would fall into that area in regards to their performance, knowing uh, the community and knowing the transitions that come in. And so we have a new leadership team that, that is coming from a school that developed a high standard of performance to take on that particular school. And so excited about that new administration that, that set there. So the goal never, the work never ends. There's continual work that we have to go after. Our team knows it and they're accountable, everyone in this room, as well as the campuses. We all own uh, that performance and where we're at. Uh, the work that we're building now goes into this school year in regards to 
knowing that for the next five years the accountability standards are set, uh, the work that we know and adopt and can move on. So we've done some work based on the previous accountability system to look at if we were still under the same metrics of our previous accountability system, where would we fall? Uh, we saw, based on some uh, data that our team was pushing through, that one of our campuses listed, which would have been one of our lower performing schools, would have cleared the accountability. And if that school would have cleared, all others that were um, above them would have cleared also. So we would be having a, a, a multi different, uh, a very different conversation um, in regards to what this looks like. So we know that we can make progress. We know once the standards are set that we begin to catch and improve this work. Our work with our teachers uh, leading up into the school year is a part of that. You heard reference to culture. You heard reference to staff uh, inserting that, ensuring that we go after that support to develop the work that we have to do. The conversations uh, that we're having right now with uh, with teams are focused on, you know, they, those conversations go deep and wide, but they include two core topics, and that's the instructional process and culture. Um, the One of the basic ways we continue to get better as a district is that we get better at the science and art of teaching through the instructional process. Identifying what those <clears throat> essential standards are uh, developing assessments around those essential standards, having a plan for intervention, and ensuring that we have a plan for enrichment as well. With this new system, it really puts an emphasis on meets and masters. So not just passing the assessment, but making sure you get students to, to show progress towards that meets and masters uh, level. Um, we're also spending a lot of time talking about culture, and that's continuing the growth mindset, ensuring that all kids can learn, and, and no excuses uh, mentality as we approach this work. I'm sorry, Mr. Kennedy? No, no, no. I just uh, Go ahead. I didn't want to interrupt you. I just wanted to say thank you. Yes, we have five IR campuses this year, but we have a lot of campuses that are not IR campuses, and a lot of credit needs to go to the teachers, the principals, the administrators, and everyone that's pitched in to try to do this, we have a battleship here. We have a huge organization. It doesn't turn around on a dime, but we've started to turn. We've made the move, and I, I want us to be happy about the achievement that we have made. We have a way to go. There's no question about that. I'm not happy with any IR campuses, but we're moving in the right direction, and we need everyone in this community to know that we are moving in the right direction. And thank you all, teachers and administrators and principals. I have one other area uh, that I'd like to touch on just to uh, keep you informed around academics, to let you know that we are listening and we are working alongside our campus teams, our teachers, our campus administrators. Uh, but I, I need you to understand that in order for us to move forward, we must uh, evaluate student learning. And there are a variety of ways to do that. Um, in addition to the differentiated methods uh, teachers utilize on a daily basis, uh, the district as a whole uses uh, several standardized uh, ways of uh, checking for understanding, whether it's grade level, campus, district. Um, we utilize a, a couple of tools and resources uh, embedded in the uh, board goals, GPMs, and CPMs, and those tools are iStation, iEspanol, I just mentioned those earlier, Fountas and Pinnell, we call it FMP, Imagine Math, of course, District Checkpoints, and of course, we look at STAR and EOC performance. I do want you to know that we are uh, reducing the number of, uh, of assessments that we're giving throughout the year. We've made some adjustments from six to nine week assessments via district checkpoints, so the overall assessments will go down so teachers can spend more time teaching uh, the curriculum. Um, we're also um, uh, moving away from mandatory star release tests um, uh, in the fall. We will be giving a star release test in the spring, but it will be in place of the 27th week district checkpoint. So I want you to, to, to know overall, 
we're listening, we're working with our teachers, we are reducing some of the assessment opportunities so they can spend time on teaching and not assessing all the time. We still feel like we have enough assessments in place uh, to meet the needs of, of reporting and monitoring associated with uh, uh, ensuring that student growth is still occurring. And just to share with you also, Board, as I've had conversations, had a breakfast with six principals invited, five could show up, one was with her family and could not make it and has rescheduled, but in that conversation with these principals, it's about autonomy, uh, getting to the point of what are things that we get in the way of that you need us to move out of the way. And so you heard campuses that have met levels of distinctions, and distinctions are, in essence, great qualifying standards that the state gives you for your performance. It's like a star when you um, received that on your grading paper when you were in elementary, in essence. It just it shows that you are one of the best in this particular area. So I've had those conversations with Midland High, I had those conversations with Carver, with Bowie, with Abel. Uh, Midland Freshman. Midland Freshman uh, and General Franks to say, these are things that we want to do and that we want to um, pursue. And if you find that there are things that um, allow you to get further faster, then what are the things that this team has to do in order to make that happen? Bonham would have also been in that category, but we've taken that outstanding principle to continue to work at South, and it has a new administrator. So we want to begin grounded in that work that Mr. Dominguez has established before we think about adding uh, that campus and its school into the fold. But those conversations are going to grow further and further to the point that schools will determine whether they need the team that sits <coughs> in this audience in order to help them move their work forward. Uh, there's conversations around assessment. You see the adjustment being made there. There's conversations about the curriculum and the pacing. Uh, you see uh, work being done there. We've done the work on the zero-based budgeting that allows campus principals to tell us what they need, uh, which started the first leg in, on the autonomy journey. So we're moving further and faster into that work so that we can then put our effort and energy to those schools that need us the most so that we know when we do that, we rise with success. We went all in on South, and I'm proud of the work that South has done, the leadership, the executive director, and the team, uh, to know that when we do that, we yield great results. And so thank you, team, for that work. Um, I wanted to add another comment to um, probably in the wrong part of the conversation, but I want to thank for the uh, IMMISD um, during convocation. And I think that, you know, a message I've been spreading lately is that, uh, you know, we have uh, district employees and that I believe in the, our district employees and that there these people that work here our professionals, our people. And I've been spreading that message that our employees here are professional people, but they're also human beings. And um, I just want the, our, our community, our staff to know that, you know, uh, I'm trying to speak on their behalf and uh, uh, carry that point that uh, we're not perfect. You know, nobody is. But we look, we look for that advantage every day to, to get better and, and to move forward. So I just wanted to say that, that I really appreciate that I am MISD uh, because, you know, as a, as a whole, that's who we are. And, uh, you know, when, uh, when things are said that, uh, about uh, Midland ISD um, that I find uh, incorrect, I tend to uh, push back and say, hey, listen, uh, these are great people, and I believe in them. So I just wanted to say that. From the teaching and learning team, from our superintendent, and from, from all of the teachers that we have been meeting with over the last few days, um, I want to send a message to the board and to the community that, yes, we will be a C district. We're not happy with that. We shouldn't be happy with that. The community should not be happy with that. We're going to do everything we can to continue the work around instructional process and culture 
to continue to move up thresholds, to move that from a C to a B and eventually an, an A. And we can do that um, um, with support from central office support services and with teachers coming together and making sure that we have systems and structures in place to ensure they can get to the work. And if they share with us any barriers that exist, it's our job to get the barriers out of the way so they can get to the work needed with kids. You're not being happy with where we are in that regard. I want to remind you, those magnet schools were put in place to become pace setters academically in MISD. And I am very concerned that Washington has fallen short as a pace setter. And I hope that in light of where Washington is, we will make a very close assessment of where our other magnets are to make sure that they don't fall below the bar. I am very concerned about Washington. The, the uh, Washington team's very concerned as well. It's one of the very uh, first campuses that we met with, met with uh, to review their accountability, to go through the uh, details of what it means, and to eventually conduct a root cause analysis. Um, uh, the work has begun. It's tough work. Uh, we don't like where we are. I don't expect for us to be here next year. Well, I hope so, Mr. Jones. I know Thank that it, it must be discouraging for those on those five campuses to be labeled improvement required. Uh, unfortunately, the label does not also indicate all the good work that's being done on those campuses. But any IR campuses in MISD is unacceptable. Yes, the good news is, is that I hope that instead of discouragement, they will be encouraged by the stories of Bonham and Sal. It can be done, can. and I'm sure it will be done. And Godspeed to you and your staff and all the campus leadership and principals and staff and teachers on those campuses. We're looking for great reports next year. Thank you. All right, any other Comments or questions for Mr. Jones? All right. Now turning to agenda item 6C, financial update. Ms. Moss, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Good evening, Mr. Davis, board members, and Mr. Riddick. I have five topics that we want to cover uh, for you tonight uh, briefly. The first topic that we're going to talk about is our fiscal year 2017-2018, and I just want to update you on where we are briefly. Um, that fiscal year ended on June 30th because we changed our fiscal year uh, back in October. The final trial balance is going to be due to our external auditors one day next week, and our accounting department is working on posting journal entries and posting receivables so that we can get that bottom line for the auditors. Um, we'll keep the board informed periodically um, through updates, email updates, and our Skyward financial software. This was our first full complete uh, month uh, period that we did on it, and it makes the information easier, um, and you'll notice that we it looks a little different for you, and uh, we'll talk about that on the 20, 2018, 2018-19 information. The fiscal year 18-19, we ended the month of July with $98.8 million in cash and short-term investments. Our interest rates again range from 1.85 to 2.23% compared to last month's range of 1.81 to 2.16. Uh, the interest earned for all the funds for July totaled $164,000, just over $164,000. July financials represent the first month of the 2018-19 fiscal year. We made some changes to the investment report, the monthly expenditure report, and the financial report. Some of the changes were uh, purely cosmetic, um, but we hope that they will make the reports a little easier for you to read and to follow along. <coughs> uh, on the investment reports, our activity funds were added to that report. You might see the amount of $1.6 million, where in the past we have not presented those on the financials, but they are a part of the investments and a part of uh, dollars for the district, so we uh, started to include those with this fiscal year. 
on the monthly expenditure report. It now includes all expenditures for the district and they are grouped together and totaled by fund. We made only minor changes again cosmetically to, to the financial reports. On the corrected copy that you received tonight, you will note a change in the wording on the bottom line of each fund presented. It now reads excess deficiency of revenues over expenditures in place of the net change in fund balance. Uh, there are entries that are made on a monthly basis to determine fund balance that are not made on a monthly basis to determine fund balance. So you'll see that terminology once a month in the, I mean, once a year in the annual audit. The next topic is our 2018-19 tax rate. Uh, the Mid Midland Central Appraisal District sent the certification of 2018 appraisal roll on July 23rd. The estimated total taxable value for 2018 was certified at $24.1 billion, and the budgeted value was $22.2 billion. The certified amounts result in an estimated tax levy of $270 million. The maintenance and operations levy is estimated at $251. The interest in sinking levy is estimated at $19.7 million. The certified levy will be provided by the appraisal district in October after any adjustments from the appraisal review board based on any protested properties. Based on the budget amounts for tax revenue, the district could recognize an increase of approximately $18 million, net of a $5 million increase to Chapter 41 or recapture expenditures for the current year. This increase in taxable values also results in an increase in the Chapter 41 payments, of course, for the 2019 for the 2019-2020 fiscal year. Um, and we're estimating that at an additional $26 million or a total estimate of $88 million in recapture for the 1920 year. So we need to keep that uh, uh, in mind as well. For the funds that we're generating based on this, uh, the superintendent and staff will review some of the board priorities that we went over uh, with you in the budget workshops to determine which of these priorities we would like to focus on with any of the excess funds that we're realizing uh, based on the taxable value increase. We'll be revisiting the bus purchases, health and wellness, innovation, attendance incentives, and other benefits. And in addition, we'll look at teacher uh, retention initiatives as well. Uh, these numbers are soft estimates. Uh, I want to make sure that we, we, we're understanding that. And they will not be final until we look at student enrollment. So tomorrow we'll start to have an idea of where our student count comes in and how it affects our Chapter 41. Um, and in the, in the bottom line, we'll know exactly what excess that we have to work with. Um, we'll be asking you later in the meeting to adopt a, a tax rate of 1.04005 for maintenance and operations and eight cents for interest in sinking. The total tax rate we will ask you to adopt is $1.12 or 1.12005. This rate is a decrease over last year of three quarters of a penny. However, the law requires the language in the motion to compare the total tax rate of $1.12 to an effective tax rate calculated by the appraisal district of $1.02, making the language uh, somewhat confusing. The effective tax rate is a tax rate that would produce the same amount of taxes if applied to the same properties that are taxed in the prior year. When appraisal values increase, the effective tax rate should decrease. So again, overall, the tax rate decreased, uh, and we were glad to be able to do that on the INS side, but the rate in which the law requires to be calculated and compared to the total rate effectively increased. So that's why you'll see the, a little difference in the language. And then I appreciate you uh, going through that part of it that we're actually having a reduction. Because it, it is confusing. It was confusing to me, so I'm sure it's confusing to our public that we're actually reducing it, not increasing it. So thank you. Okay. Um, Ms. Moss, I want one question. Uh, in our current year's budget, we are estimated to send $57.5 million to Austin as part of the Robin Hood. Payment and earlier you mentioned what your estimated fee
figure for next year was going to be? It was going to go from an estimated amount of 57 million to what? 88. So uh, 88 million. 88 million is for the 1920 year. Okay. That 57 million that we budgeted actually increased because our taxable values increased. So that amount went up as well. So we're looking at 62 million for this current year. Okay. So the current year is going to increase. We'll know more tomorrow and the, in the coming weeks, but right. Uh, right. the budgeted amount was 57.5 due to the increase in certified values. That amount is going to increase to estimated to be 62 million. Yes. And go up to 88 million next year. For next year. Yes. Okay. Sir. All right. Thank you. And of course, we know that that number changes during the year. Um, just as in this year, we started the year with thinking that it would be 38, 42 million. It actually has come down to um, 38 million based on the student enrollment. This past year. This past year. You're right. Yes, okay. Sir. Not this coming year. Okay. Right. Yes. All right. Thank you. Are there any other questions on the tax rate for 1819? I'd like to hear some good news. What about yeah, your next item? The, and I would just wanted to mention the fact that that money that, that that's money that the state requires us to send back to them. So I know a lot of people are like, why do you send the money? We're required to send them the money. So it's not a choice from MISD to send that money to them. It's, it's part of the state finance system, uh, which have been declared broken, but uh, that's required by law, so uh, just want to put that out there. Okay. So our next item is the 2017-18 first financial rating, and most of you are already aware the official preliminary 17-18 school first report rating the district received from the Texas Education Agency on the 8th. We received 92 out of a possible 100 points, resulting in a letter grade of A and a superior rating. Um, we did not receive the full points on indicators six, seven, and eight. And so we reviewed those items um, and um, looked at our audit report to make sure that they were okay and we didn't need to appeal those items. Uh, they are calculated correctly and we will strive to um, increase uh, that rating from a 92 to 100 points as, as best we can. We're putting um, uh, streamlining processes, processes putting things in place to, to help us get that rating up. So you're not going to appeal it? No, sir, I don't think we can. We've looked at the audit report and it, the numbers are, are, are correct. Well, I'd just like to say I, I think you should be commended along with the Finance Committee for reaching this goal so soon. Yeah, and, and I wanted to add to that too. Um, we talk a lot about how the academic side of this ship moves really slowly. And um, in one year, uh, with your guidance and leadership and your team's work, we've made a drastic improvement in our finances of MISD. And your group is highly, should be highly commended for the work you've done and the way that that's come, going from a 92 this year from a 72 last year. And I think it's something we can feel good about, and, it, and it, it should show to the community that we are serious about finances and taking care of their money. Um, the one thing I wanted to make about uh, Robert's comment and your discussion about the, the effective tax rate is the state is going to request or going to take our money regardless. So if we lower the rate down to get it to what the effective rate would be a zero change, we're still paying them the full amount. So all we're doing is cutting into our pocket. So when people say that we the rate's not gone up, our, our rate. But what we're going to pay, what we're going to receive is going to be better, and that's just because if we drop it, we're still going to get penalized. And then what we need to do is we we have a net 18, maybe 18 million for next year. We go wisely with how we spend that toward these incentives in Group B and Group C, Tier C and Tier uh, B and C, uh, how we spend that. But we also got to think about what do we put back to cover the 88 million coming next year. Exactly. And so I just want to uh, draw attention to that. But I. Y'all have done a fabulous job. And thank you, Mr. Murray. Um, and I'd like to say it's a team effort, financial services. We have a good team. We put a, a good team together. Uh, but we've also branched out to the other departments in the district. Um, it takes them getting on board and, and, and uh, accepting some of our challenges to do some things differently. And so I applaud uh, the whole staff. It's been a team effort for us to get to that point. Uh, we're not where we want to be. We still have some things that we want to uh, 
do differently. Um, and so we'll, we'll move forward with those. Our next item is financial risk assessment, and I'm going to bring uh, Ms. Carla Martin, she's our Executive Director of Financial Services, to um, go over that with you. It's a new item that we've started this year. Good evening, Mr. Davis, board members, and Mr. Riddick. I wanted to share with you the financial risk assessment process that we'll be performing for this school year. Um, so first I want, we can talk about what is risks, and we, in our terms, we like to say that's the possibility of an event occurring that will have an effect on achieving our objectives, and usually that's measured in terms of impact and likelihood. I like to think of it, well, what could go wrong? Um, so what's the likelihood that a specific risk is going to occur? How severe could that be? How quickly will that affect the district and for how long? Um, annually, a district-wide risk assessment should be performed so that we can identify the potential risks that the district may face. Um, I know for us, a, uh, a risk assessment hasn't been conducted for the district in the past because usually this is an internal audit function, but we believe that it's important to perform this risk assessment so that in order that we can have, um, you know, identify what we need to work on and also have an effective internal control system. So the first step that we did was we developed, um, we needed to identify the risk, the district's risk profile, and that would just include areas and processes that we have, that have a potential for impacting the district. Then the second step was we need, we created or de um, developed our assessment criteria. Based on how you measure risk, we split those into our impact factors and then also our likelihood factors. And within the impact factors, we've um, identified the financial that we would have to look at would be the financial impact, any compliance issues, the criti criticality of that unit, and adverse publicity. So a financial impact, we're looking at you know, considering the overall financial impact of that process, um, the dollars involved, and what would that impact be to the district if in inappropriate activity were to occur. For compliance, we would have to consider the complexity and volume of transactions that were required for um, compliance requirements, and what would that impact be if we were to receive penalties, fines, litigations, or even loss of funding sources because of compliance issues. Criticality is more of um, what would the impact of the unit be if it's unable to provide its service within um, a required time frame and, or at an expected level. And then adverse publicity is just what is the impact if, of negative public exposure related to that process. For likelihood, we looked at the four factors of control environment, um, organizational structure, complexity of transactions, and audit history. So for co control environment, just in that term of what could go wrong, what could go wrong given the current control environment? And that would mean the existing internal controls, existing processes and procedures, and with the management experience of the people involved, and any other historical problems that have occurred. We want to look at what is the likelihood of fraud, waste, or abuse based on the current control environment. For um, organizational structure, a lot of it is really, um, have there been any significant changes in that unit's um, management personnel or in how they are operating. Complexity of transactions would be what could go wrong given the, um, how complex transactions are occurring, the amount of time it takes, the number of steps, those issues, and then audit history. We want to, we're going to look at when was the last time an audit was performed in this, in this unit, and also the results of those audits, and what's the likelihood that any findings would occur again, and those findings not being corrected in a timely manner. So those are the criteria that we've developed, and now our next step is to assess and categorize those risks. Um, we'll be categorizing them in the high, medium, or um, low in both impact and likelihood, and so a high would be, a high impact is that the potential for a material impact would be um, on the district's earnings or assets or just our reputation is really high. And then a high, likely, a high likelihood would be is there's high probability that the risk will occur. So low would be low probability that this risk could occur and that probably the impact would either be minor in size or limited in scope. This would be... Um, 
the assessment would be working with other areas so we could gather more information on how relevant that is to the factor. Once we've um, assessed and categorized those risks, then we would have an overall risk for that process and that would help, in, um, help us identify what are the areas we need to look at and then develop a review plan on what we kind of just need to have a closer lens at. So we just wanted to share that with you and we are now looking at, we're at the third stage. Any questions? Oh, it sounds uh, fabulous. I mean, it sounds like a, a new tool and, and, you know, this is what a lot of the big companies do and I'm glad to see it. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, next, District Report 6D, Innovation Update, System of Great Schools. Ms. Kale, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Davis, President Davis, School Board, Mr. Riddick. Thank you for letting me present this evening. Since the July board meeting, we have had listen and learns, planning sessions with multiple entities. We've uh, issued the call for quality schools, request for information, held staff sessions on that, and submitted and received some information on our transformation zone planning grant. What I want to do is give you some good news this evening with a little drama built in. So just for you, Mr. Murray. So when we look at this information, we, we started out with some TNTP funding in the fall. We've had, um, from the Education Foundation, we've had a report of nearly $2 million of support from across our community. Our Transformation Zone Planning Grant was $450,000. Our PTEC Planning Grant was $25,000. We've received funding to support our FAFSA process for our students of $10,000. We had our Grow Your Own Grant of $106,000 and we have teachers working on that. You will meet them next month. We have our school fund transformation planning grant, which is in conjunction with Midland College, where we have received $300,000. We, of course, have received $5 million from the county commissioner's court, and we just found out that we have received $5.5 million for the transformation zone implementation grant for multiple campuses for a grand total of nearly $14 million coming into the district just this school year. Ms. Kale, I'm going to stop you right there. This is fabulous work, and so before you get into the work, I just want to say that this is a great job, and I appreciate the, the, effect, the way your group has gone after this work and stayed the course and refiled and resubmitted and stayed with them and emailed and followed up, so this is just a great job. Thank you. It's not just our group. It's the entire district. Multiple departments are involved in all this process, as well as community members and business and philanthropy. So I, we appreciate everybody. I wasn't here for the opportunity with the Benton County Commissioner's Court, but I would like to thank them for their effort. And, uh, and then obviously, you know, everybody that gave us money, obviously it's, uh, these are exciting times. And uh, I have no doubt that this is gonna bear a lot of good fruit. So thank you. Thank you. So what are we gonna do before September? We're kicking off key communicators again. Our school performance framework planning is deep into the work and we will take the accountability results that we just received as well as our K-12 survey data and plunk that data into the school performance framework as we build what is called a community-based accountability system that will inform our community more about our schools than just test results. Our transformation subcommittee will continue their meetings and, and start those up next week. And they will have a heavy emphasis on grant planning as well as implementing the four levers of the system of great schools. Our unified enrollment process will begin. We, we've got to establish a policy committee to review what we're doing there as we create an opportunity for families to select schools based upon the choice for what meets their child's needs and then we will create an online dashboard for them to be informed about these opportunities for easy access as well as selection. And then of course, one of the most important things is continued grant planning and execution of what we're doing through multiple conversations with philanthropy, business and industry, TEA, 
as well as continued conversations with IDEA public schools and legacy traditional schools. Do you have any questions for me? Thank you, Ms. Bale, and congratulations on the continuation of the Transformation Zone Grant. Thank you. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up, District Report 6E, facility update. Mr. Riggin, welcome. Good evening, uh, President Davis, Board of Trustees, uh, Superintendent Riddick. Uh, I'm James Riggin with uh, Chief Operations Officer, and it is my pleasure tonight to bring to this uh, to bring to the trustees an update on the work of the Facility Master Planning Committee. Uh, since January, uh, when this uh, committee was formed, uh, this committee has been hard at work uh, uh, looking at our facilities and uh, looking to the future for what facilities need to offer to serve our students. We have met uh, 12 times uh, to review data, uh, look at uh, uh, a look at uh, district reports and and then also tour our facilities uh, we have had a I think an outstanding uh, attendance rate at these uh, committee meetings uh, with an average of about 66 percent attendance rate uh, from this committee at these meetings uh, the work is difficult and hard with this committee and uh, the work continues we have reviewed uh, existing facility conditions. We've uh, looked at uh, uh, district uh, facility needs. We've toured existing district facilities. Uh, and, and, and we've looked at other facilities within, within our community and the state. Uh, we are, have reviewed uh, and looking at our existing building capacities and what will be required for future capacities for our uh, uh, district. We've uh, looked at past and uh, uh, projected membership to predict future student growth. One of the largest, um, uh, most difficult items of our committee is to look at multiple educational models uh, for our district. What will our district look like in 10 years from now? What will the facilities look like that will serve our district's educational needs in 10 years? This may require change in our, 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 our facilities uh, and what they currently look like. These uh, facility uh, models have tried to answer one main, one main question. What will need to be built in our community within the next 10 years to support and house public education in Midland? The committee has currently narrowed their discussion to a possible two educational models. And currently, the work of the committee is to look at uh, projected cost estimates for each of these models and we're looking at developing a timeline of providing these facilities uh, to the committee. Again, the work of this committee is to provide a report to the board uh, and this report to the board is expected to be completed by this committee and brought forth to this board for, their, for your review and your consideration in December. So that is where we are currently. The work continues. So we've been meeting twice a month, and we will continue to do so until December. And um, uh, the work is difficult, hard, with lots of good decisions being made for this district. One of the things that we have discussed in our, uh, uh, all our work is hinging on what are the projected student enrollments for the next 10 years. Uh, we have historical data. We have projections based on where we've been and, and growth that ex is expected. But uh, we are also planning as a district to um, uh, 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 obtain proposals, to obtain a, a, a demographic study for the district, to verify our numbers with uh, uh, others' numbers that, that uh, will either uh, verify what we believe to be true for future numbers in, in the future. So that work is also ongoing. Any questions? Is there, uh, I know it's a lot of work and I appreciate all the work that's been done to date. Is there any reasonable chance in your mind that the committee could complete its work and make its recommendations before December? Or do we you could, think that's a, that's a very likely ending date? We, we could do that. Uh, um, 
I don't want to rush anything. I'm just curious as to whether it's more likely that. than not it will be December. Is there a reasonable chance it could be before? If this board would like it before December, we'll make every effort to, uh, to make that happen, yes. Well, no, I'm, I'm not suggesting you rush anything. If you're meeting twice a month, I'm sure you're plowing ahead. I was just wondering with those twice a month schedule whether it doesn't sound like it's going to happen before December, but uh, I was just curious. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Rick, I was just uh, addressing that as uh, being on the facilities committee. Uh, uh, Mr. Riggin did some great work in this last facility meeting we had. There was uh, kicked off some great discussion about where we are and what do we actually want to send to the board or what did they want to send to the board um, as I, sitting on that committee. But um, I, I, I think that we could probably get there um, earlier. I think the committee would make their minds up. I, James and I try to not impose our decisions on it, but um, I think they can get there. And I, I think the committee has seen a lot of great information. And this last proposal talked about um, the idea of how you're breaking up schools, how you're building schools, how this uh, district uh, system of great schools, uh, Mrs. Kell's works coming in all of that tying in together so it says what does MIST have to build what's going to be built for us or help with us partners with us and so I think it's some great work but I, I do think we could get there quicker um, and I I wouldn't say that without rushing you but he he put together a great presentation this last time that I mean I really saw the group start to come together focusing an idea now let's say what are we gonna the question became what are we going to propose to the board as opposed to um, we think we like what, what what we see. So, yes, sir. yeah, I think yes, if sir. we if we narrow our focus to those models, I think we could expedite the process. Yes, I agree with your comments. Yes, thank you. All right, thank you. Thanks for all the work. All right, District Report Six F Staffing Update. Mr. Bailey, welcome. Mr. Davis, board president, board members, Mr. Riddick, superintendent. Um, this is our district staffing report uh, for this month. Of course, we are um, up against the first day of school, and um, we are glad to be able to bring this report tonight. I first want to say uh, much appreciation to one of the hardest working um, teams in the district, and that is the HR team that has limited time off during the summer, and they've been working all summer to try to um, achieve some high goals. As the information that was presented to you in the board packet, you do see that um, with the number of vacancies that we reported at the last board meeting, we were sitting about 83 percent, 84 percent. Mr. Riddick mentioned in a meeting not long ago that um, he'd like for us to get to 90 percent, and we were definitely trying to get there. Um, you do see in the report that was presented that we are 90 percent staffed, um, were 90 percent staffed actually um, upon reporting um, for, for this board meeting. Um, recent information of tonight is that we're at 91 percent and so we have actually um, we're a little bit closer about 113 vacancies at this point in time so as we continue to work and, and we look at the years past of course we are starting school earlier so we have um, this is a different a short summer and we'll continue to work over the next several weeks to try to get closer to that um, that marker we have some very innovative um, programs in place and things that we are trying to do to make sure that every classroom has a qualified instructor um, in front of students and we also have six certified teachers that are coming to help um, in a temporary basis. Um, we have five that are working towards certification, 19 that are um, bachelor degreed and then we have six just long-term subs that will also be helping to ensure that we are ready for the first day of school. As we continue to look at numbers over the next several weeks, we'll be able to make adjustments across the district um, as we um, realize enrollment, and it's not just projections based upon last year. If you do remember, we did add 40 new positions this year, and last year we started school about 55 position, 55 um, vacant positions as well. So we're in the neighborhood. We, um, we've experienced um, a, a great transition this year, but we feel like that we are, are definitely making great strides to, to get to the place that we need to be. So the shorter time frame, right? <laughs> we're, cut, we're cutting you on time frame here, which uh, is probably hindering the process a little bit. But um, so I'm saying this, I guess, for a general public that 
that we moved the school year, we started early, which puts obviously more pressure on yourself. And, uh, and then uh, obviously people, uh, I, I don't know if it could be the possibility also that there's uh, people not willing to, uh, are backing out or not coming to the district due to the fact that we're starting a little earlier. Is there any of that going on that, that you think that is holding people back maybe because we started a little earlier? I just think that we have a, a number of, of challenges in front of us. Um, I believe that our co local economy presents challenges. Um, um, there, there's, there's just a lot of challenges, but we're going to do all that we can to overcome all of those challenges, and I think that we're on the right um, road to try to get there. We'll, we'll have to think um, outside of the box. Um, I can tell you that you've heard about um, secondary schools and we're working with, with the secondary team to try to ensure that we have some certified instructors that will be coming in virtually to the classroom. And so the structure for that program, it's, it's a little bit different, but we're still striving to make sure that we're meeting all the needs of our students. So we have a lot of challenges, but we're going to get there and we feel like we're, we're on our way. Okay. A lot of hard work, but we're going to get there. I'm aware of one little redhead cutie that would love to have a, fa a fifth grade math teacher at Faskin. So that would Absolutely. be, if anybody's out there as a math teacher, we'd love to have that. Uh, Ms. Kirk, uh, Mr. Uh, Bailey would like to talk to you as soon as the meeting's I've over. i to sign her up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Good luck. All right, next, school security update. Chief Barkley, welcome. Thank you, Board President Davis, uh, Board Trustees, and Superintendent Riddick. Uh, I'm newly appointed uh, Police Chief uh, Arthur Barclay, uh, for those of you that don't know me. Uh, as detailed in my school security update report to the Board, my initial plan for the safety and security of the district focuses on recommendations detailed in the Governor uh, Greg Abbott School and Firearm Safety Action Plan released in May of 2018. Uh, this action plan represents several recommendations which focus on best practices to promote a safe, secure school environment. Recommendations such as maximizing current building security measures at each campus by regulating access locations where possible. Since my appointment, each campus school resource officer has conducted detailed building security assessments on the campuses they're responsible for. These assessments will be brought to the attention of school principals to get their input and possibly make changes. Another recommendation from the governor's action plan focuses on empowering all stakeholders at schools to be situationally aware on campuses. Students and faculty members should both feel responsible for reporting crime and suspicious activities on their school campuses. A mechanism should be in place so that this can be done anonymously to prevent any retaliation from occurring once these reports are made. Uh, that's something that can be done uh, just by putting the right procedures in place. Forming multidisciplinary behavioral threat assessment teams on campuses was also recommended in the governor's action plan. These teams are typically made up of school resource officers, mental health professionals, and school personnel. Behavioral threat assessment teams are geared towards identifying potential students at risk of being a danger to themselves or others in middle schools and high schools. Another action plan recommendation urges coordination and collaboration with other law enforcement agencies, first responders, uh, to develop strong school safety programs. Agency representatives I've met with in furtherance of this recommendation since my appointment include the Midland Independent School District, I mean Midland uh, Police Chief Seth Herman, uh, Juvenile Prosecutor Carolyn Thurman, Chief Juvenile Probation Officer Forrest Hanna, Midland County Sheriff's Department Lieutenant Colston, DPS Area Field Lieutenant Warren Spivey. Both Midland Police Chief Herman and DPS Lieutenant Spivey have recently agreed to commit field personnel for periodic safety checks at Midland Independent School Districts. This is something that was done in Fort Worth for a long period of time uh, and was implemented with, under my command and has worked well within Fort Worth in order to be able to increase the amount of uh, officers going in and out of schools. DPS Lieutenant Spivey has also committed to a plan in which troopers 
will attend major school sporting events on duty to increase security personnel at these events. I will recommend that both agencies commit the majority of their building security efforts in our elementary schools, which do not have security assigned to them currently. Other agencies which are critical in the event that a joint emergency response incident occurs on a school campus are municipal fire departments and emergency ambulance services. Efforts have been made to initiate uh, conversations with these agencies and results are pending in order to be able to make contact and try and determine what can be done in order to be able to find some plans that may work in case of a school incident. The Midland Independent School District Police Department currently has 15 approved school security personnel positions. Of the 15 positions, there are currently four vacancies. Two of the four vacancies were just approved during this budget year. The recruitment of quality applicants to fill these positions has been a challenge due to the salary being offered at other local departments being higher than what is offered here in, at Midland ISD. Midland County Sheriff's deputies are utilized to help beef up police security at football games each year. They're not utilized for any other ISD events. Because I'm new to the district, I would have to monitor how crime response and school safety concerns are currently addressed with available staffing before being able to make a credible assessment regarding needing personnel increases within the district. My preliminary assessment of the district, though, uh, based upon uh, my current uh, overview of what I've seen, is that um, school threats are increasing and if this is, continues, then there needs to be more of a school presence uh, for security officers within elementary schools. So there needs to be some type of an increase in the amount of campuses that uh, are visited by officers. And I don't know if we can do that with the current uh, staffing that we have. Roving patrol units can be utilized to cover several elementary campuses under such a response plan if uh, additional units were approved, or additional positions were allowed to be uh, placed in those positions or to increase the amount of uh, visits that we can do to elementary schools. Increased personnel and increased access control and building monitoring technology appears to be what would offer the most security and safety benefits to the district long term based upon my assessment. That includes my board update at this point and I'm welcome to any questions. I do have a, uh, I do have a question I guess and I appreciate the, uh, the uh, short term work uh, that you have put in from a security standpoint. Uh, have we considered, I guess, when we get with possibly the, uh, uh, the Midland Chief of Police and possibly our Lieutenant, uh, to maybe when those uh, officers are possibly uh, on days off or off duty, that they could possibly be a, uh, a part time help to the district from a security standpoint? You know, that's it. That is an option, you know, if they are willing to come in and work overtime. Uh, because at this point, the information that I'm getting is that uh, DPS will come in and work uh, on their own duty time. So as a result, no money will be expended from the school district funds in order to be able to supplement the field units at this point. So, but it, that is an option, I'm sure, if, uh, if we can offer them the amount of, I guess, salary that they make at DPS. The salary may become a problem. I don't know exactly what the amount is that we can offer them, but that's an option. Okay, I, and I, I understand that as well, and I'm appreciative of, of them wanting to offer uh, the help during, during the, uh, the duties that they're on to, uh, to help uh, alleviate uh, the rise of, of our budget uh, from a security standpoint, but just looking at options and didn't know if you guys had looked at that as a possibility because uh, whether we're paying uh, what we pay officers versus what they're making might be another uh, another uh, case to look at and maybe not having to pay uh, as much, I guess, is what they're based on user experience, but I know uh, people want to be paid for what their, what their, uh, their collective value is. So again, I appreciate uh, y'all's efforts. Yes, sir. You feel like one of your goals is to bring the, um, more communication with agencies? Uh, you I know, so. as some of this, his recommendations are being made and so forth, because right. uh, of the awareness and all that. And uh, it seems like in the past, a little bit, just a little bit in the past, we've had, it doesn't seem like we got the 
all the agencies talking the same language. And, right. And uh, so it'd be nice to kind of get a, uh, I'm an MSD, you know, with the, with the, uh, with our other agencies. So, and, uh, which I know they're on board. I mean, but uh, I appreciate any effort in that area. Yes, sir. I mean, I, I think it's very important that we reach out as much as possible to, you know, the local police department, uh, fire department, because they would be involved in any joint response that we would make to a school uh, if there was, a, you know, an incident that occurred. So the fire department is very critical to any type of a response that we would make. So we want to actually be able to train with those units. And so far, we are already trained with the Midland Police Department. Uh, we train periodically with the DPS. We train with uh, Midland College. So. Uh, it's only natural that we start to train with the fire department, I think. All right, Chief Barkley, we Thank look you. forward to your completion of your assessment. As you know, uh, we are excited to receive an award from the Midland County Commissioner's Court, and those monies, some of which are available to be used for enhancement of security costs. So we look forward to your assessment and any uh, recommendations you have on, on how some of those monies may be spent for that purpose. So thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. your work. All right, next, District Report 6H, Bullying Committee update. Ms. Moore, welcome. Good evening, Board President Davis, Board of Trustee members, Superintendent Riddick. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Teresa Moore, and I'm the Executive Director of Student Services. And the report that I bring to you tonight is a reflection of the work to date of the committee um, to review the Midland ISD policies and procedures as they relate to bullying. Um, I have some members of our committee here with us tonight and I'd like to introduce those members to you. Our co-chair is Joelle Bracken, and she's right here. Um, our director, and I may I'll just do this so y'all can see a little bit better. Our director of guidance and counseling, Mr. Ron Moss. We have one of our um, principals, Jennifer Jones, in the back, we have um, another one of our principals. I don't, I don't know if I still see her, but maybe I'm just missing her. Stephanie Carnett, she's on the, on the um, committee as well. Chief Barclay is on the committee. And then we have one of our community members here this evening, Mr. Clint Williamson. So we're very happy to have him here. So we wanted to take a moment to introduce those members to everyone. Um, Thank you all. Thanks for serving. Appreciate it. To date, we, the committee has met three times, and you'll see those um, dates that we've met. We um, have a, another meeting scheduled for later in August, and at that time we'll set the remainder of our meetings through the first semester. So our, our work has taken us through three meetings so far. The topics that we've discussed have centered around um, some, some urgent topics. Um, for example, what programs we can implement um, immediately to uh, prevent bullying. Um, we've had discussions regarding the definition that um, not only the, the district uses, but other entities may use to define bullying. Um, we've had conversations on additional definitions with regard to, to some of those more subjective terms such as reasonable or empathy, um, what exactly an imbalance of power might mean. We, we haven't exactly come to conclusions on all these discussions. These are ongoing. Um, we've had conversations regarding how we record and document our bullying investigations, um, where we would hang on to the records, um, training for personnel, and then monitoring students for patterns of behavior. Um, uh, further topics considered were um, how to involve our parents and, and keep those, our parents in the loop with regard to um, from the beginning with the report all the way through the, to the conclusion of the investigation, um, how our counselors should be involved, as well as um, information on how to conduct unbiased investigations as well. So from those three meetings, um, we've, we've um, done a lot of research and we've, and we've talked for, for a long time with regard to some recommendations that we would like to bring forth to you this evening. Um, those three recommendations are outlined on this slide, and they include um, using as a district an app-based tool for uh, both anonymous and non-anonymous reporting 
of bullying and other behaviors such as um, any sort of drug use, inappropriate behaviors by, by, by anyone who may be on our campuses, any suspicious persons. Um, so there are a couple of, of nationally recognized products that the committee has considered. Um, we've also um, given that information to our campus administrators and all of that information with regard to an app-based um, reporting tool was well received by our campus administrators. This, uh, the, the tool that we are considering would allow almost instant communication between the person making the report and the person receiving the report. These um, apps are customizable so that you can select who would receive those reports. Should I pause for some questions on that one? Is there a cost associated um, with the app? Yes, sir, there, there is a cost associated and, and um, we are um, studying the possibility of funding that app with our um, Title IV federal funds and uh, the actual title of that escapes me right now, but those funds are required to be used for safety and security as well as um, some other educational measures. So we believe those funds might be appropriate for this particular endeavor. And, and if the district were to purchase the app, then that would be free of charge to parents and students to utilize that app, is that correct? Absolutely, sir. They would, parents and students would download the app and then they would be able to access the, the utilization of that app by um, entering a school code. And so that school code would uh, kind of attach that person using the app with the group that would receive those reports. Okay. How, how, does the, how do you keep using the app? How do you know that, I guess technology, but how do you know that the person is here locally or, you know, that's doing the reporting, that it's not some random person somewhere making because reports? Because when, when the, Let's say, for example, I am a student at um, Midland High. I would download the app on my device or my tablet, or I can access it from a, a regular computer. And then before I could send or receive any messages, I must enter a school code that's provided by the school. So, so not the whole world wouldn't be able to make a report for us. It would be specific to that student in that school. Uh, and how would the code be? Is it posted or they have to call the um, district? The, the, the campus would provide that, the um, access code to the parents and students of that school. Okay. So, so I suppose it is possible for, for some outside person to obtain those codes, um, but we would, we would do our best to, to make sure that we limited that information. Okay. I guess, Ms. Moore, one of the, one of the questions I, or I'd like to bring up in our last uh, school board we had for the Summer Leadership Conference in, uh, in Fort Worth that I attended, uh, Keller ISD uh, done a presentation on bullying, on how, they, how they've handled it. And they've got uh, out there on their website, uh, they've got a, uh, a ton of information on how they've handled bullying over the last uh, five to 10 years, if you will. And I'm not saying that they have it mastered, uh, but I think they had some uh, some key information I think that would be beneficial uh, to our district what, without us having to go through and reinvent the wheel. Absolutely. Uh, it could possibly be a, uh, be a saving uh, to the district on the title money even that you're talking about to maybe utilize uh, in another area. So, uh, I mean, if we could do that and maybe if uh, with uh, Mr. Riddick's guidance, maybe yourself and a couple of others from the committee uh, might have an opportunity to go down and, and visit with them. I did visit with them after the course, and they, they welcomed us uh, to call them and their officer as well, uh, um, Mr. Clay. So I think that, that opens opportunities for us to learn from other people that might have seen some, some situations that we might not have encountered yet that might be a, a good, good measure for us. Absolutely, because we, we, that is one thing that we have done in our committees. We've tried to to research best practices so that we're not doing just like you said, reinventing the wheel. So we'll absolutely reach out to Keller and um, look at, at what they have and hopefully learn some things from them. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, is the fee a one-time fee um, it, for the it, purchase of it? Or is there a fee every time someone uses it? 
No, sir. It, it's just an annual fee. So we would purchase the use of the app for one school year, and we would evaluate its effectiveness at the end of that of that. Time. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions on that? Thank you. Um, the second recommendation for the from the committee, um, we did hear, and we we've heard it from our own um, personnel, and we've heard it from community that we um, need to improve our um, uniformity with regard to, to training our staff and ensuring our staff understands the characteristics of bullying and, and how it can impact our students. So again, we have researched a, a commercially based product that is um, endorsed by the Texas Association of School Boards um, to provide a, a, an online training course that we would ask that all of our staff, and, and by all, we mean all of our staff, um, would view that, that training course. It, it comes with an assessment at the end to evaluate um, the, the participants' understanding of that. How um, it, far along are we? I'm sorry, sir? How far along are we on that process? Um, we are ready to move forward with these items um, after this presentation this evening. Um, how many staff have already been trained? Um, at this past week at Elevate, um, I held two sessions with this information, um, so they were attended and, and they were full sessions. They were not in large venues, but they were full sessions. And then we've also had two sessions with all of our campus administrators as, as an initial piece to training. Will that filter down to teachers? Um, yes, sir, and we are hoping with the second recommendation, the purchase of the, the, the training products, um, it is trackable so that every campus administrator can keep up with who has um, completed that course and ensure that everyone has. Um, the principal supervisor can track and make sure the principal has done it and, and all the way up. So we would all be accountable in one way or another to, to um, ensure that we've viewed that, that information. Um, we would roll out a, a timeline for campus staff and, and staff in the district. We would say it's available starting here, and our expectation is that everyone would have completed that by a particular date. Um, that wouldn't be overly burdensome, but, but give everybody plenty of time. That, that timeline, will we be able to do that and get really be prepared not to go into deeper into the year, but have all that done early yes, in the sir. year? Yes, sir. That, that is the, the, the desire of the committee is to move forward with this as quickly as possible. Okay. And, and to have that done um, very early in the first semester. Yes, sir. So we'll be, we'll be presenting to principals at our first principals meeting um, all this information. They've got the precursor during our Elevate time. We'll be introducing this, and we want to do it well. So we want to be sure that everybody's trained um, well during that time. And then, then it will be integrated down to the teaching and staff level so that we're able to uh, take the utilization of the training tool that expands not just bullying, but goes into a lot of areas that other departments can use for verification of teacher notification around um, trainings that are required by us through the state and trainings that we want our team to go after that are embedded within the product. Yes. There, there's a, just for the behaviorally emotional piece, there's, there's probably 15 to 20 courses um, that we believe would be beneficial to our staff. I guess one, one other thing, uh, is there any way, I'm sure there is, but with TASB, with our TASB lawyers every year at, at our uh, school board convention, they do, uh, they do a role play in an enactment of some of the uh, behaviors. So you have younger teachers and experienced teachers. Some of them might not recognize uh, when something's act actually taking place, even if it's right there in front of their eyes. Uh, so, and I don't know if that's something to maybe think about or consider uh, going forward. I know it can't happen today or tomorrow, but maybe in the very near future where people recognize those type of behaviors and then be able to document and maybe prevent it from happening going on uh, at a later time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, the, the third recommendation that we bring for you today, and I believe that it is included as an attachment and, and it's a draft. If you will recall the last time we, we shared information with all of you regarding bullying, we um, went over the checklist that our school district currently uses. 
So the one that's provided for you is a draft, and we hope that it's a little bit more detailed and a little bit simpler for our campus um, administrators to follow when making the determination that a, um, a student's behavior may meet the definition of bully. So again, it's, it's still in draft, and um, we, we're still refining it. Um, we've gotten some input from, again, our campus principals. We, we presented that at the Elevate um, Academic summit, la summit last week, and we're getting input from our administrators on even better ways to, to make that a useful tool. Is this in guidance with the, with the uh, draft from TEA? Um, yes, sir. Okay. It, it's aligned with that. It just offers a couple of little different things for um, our principals to use as reminders when making those considerations. Okay. Yes, sir. In your rectangle on your header, should I read if one or more? Is that your draft? Yes. Yes, I apologize for that. Again, it's a draft, and, and we are still working to revise it. Are there any other questions about that one? Um, our next steps, we're going to continue to meet regularly. We're developing a survey to send out to all of our campuses to gauge um, what our campuses are doing because we do believe that we've got lots of places where we've got lots of wonderful things happening. And so we want to utilize our in-house talent and maximize on that. So we're going to send a survey to campuses to get a better understanding of what they are doing and, and how well it's working so that we can spread that out to other campuses. Um, we are still in the, the stages of finalizing the bullying checklist, and then again, we're going to develop that impl and implement that training plan for all of our staff, starting with that online uh, or the, the video training component that we mentioned earlier. Um, just to recap our training, I did present this information, our board policies on bullying, our bullying checklist our responsibilities for investigation and, and reporting and taking action on that to all of our new teachers at New Teacher Orientation. We made presentations at um, Elevate. And then um, Ms. Rivera has sessions already planned for our campus administrators and other staff members to go through throughout the course of the year to become better equipped and understand and implement restorative practices within our classroom. Classrooms, excuse me. And that concludes our presentation and our update. Um, I don't know if any of the committee members ha have anything that they would like to share, if you've got any questions for, for any of those, um, any of those members, or if I can answer any other questions at this time. I'd like to thank everyone for doing the hard work and uh, being a member. Uh, as you realize, it's, it's a lot of stuff. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Thanks to the committee and all their work. All right. Next, uh, district report, 6I School Quality and Climate Surveys. Ms. Kale, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for having me back. Um, as in relation to the survey, as you saw in your packet, it is multiple pages long with a lot of information about cumulative results from the surveys that were handled on all of our campuses. I want to give you just an update about what is happening or what has happened with that information. Our campus executive directors worked with campus principals to analyze each of their campus survey results and look at the data from a variety of lenses that could push the campus to really look toward concentrate, concentrated actions that they could embed into their campus improvement plan to improve overall staff, parent, and quality for students. They, looked, they focused on three high and low areas as well as looking at trends across their survey results. Our full objective within the campus surveys is to close the perceptual gap between our students, staff, and parents in relation to the results, to have quali qualitative data to support decision making toward improving the instructional and cultural climate of the campus. We also received verbatim responses from each of the campus um, surveys, and each of the campuses are able to go in and look at that information and analyze what can be done with that information. And then also, the information from this data will be used to populate our school performance framework for that component of the work. 
Other than that, if you have any specific questions, I'll be happy to go over them. We can look at the highest and lowest ranking indicators, which start on page 32 of the PowerPoint, or we can go into questions, whatever the will of the board. My question is, I've, you know, I turn to the key insights page in which they make a number of recommendations on, uh, they note discrepancies where they exist, significant ones, and uh, suggest that, make suggestions that things need to be done to, uh, to narrow the gaps that exist and the, and the perceptions and discrepancies that exist. What is the plan going forward to is there a plan going forward to implement those suggestions, and if so, how? As far as um, the campuses, they will be looking at that information and, and significantly embedding that information into their campus improvement plans. As far as a district, we looked at where we were last time we did this versus the similarities that we saw this time and are looking at how that can be embedded into the district improvement plan as far as actionable items toward improvement. And who, who will be responsible for following up with the campuses to make sure that they do take steps to do as been suggested? That will most likely fall onto teaching and learning and campus executive directors. Okay. And you anticipate that that specific, that when they do so, that the specific plans on how to implement these suggestions will be incorporated into a school or a campus improvement plan? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Other questions? Let me ask, oh, did, did I, we, did, go ahead. Did, I'm sorry, um, did we, I know there's a cost associated with this, so do we plan on doing this again next year? Yes, sir, because this will be an annual item. Okay. Um, at the very least, biannual, because it will also be feeding data into our school performance framework. So then that gives an ED the ability to determine if a campus is paying attention to what's being said and making changes, because if they see the same repetitive answers, then they know it's not been, no one's paid attention to it. Yes, sir. We'll okay. have annual comparative data available. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, it's, just to be correct, is staff taking, staff supposed to take this? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, I want to make a comment about adult behavior because I looked at, I looked at some of the numbers, you know. Uh, so, I was a bit disappointed that adult behavior hasn't changed because nobody took it. Or, or maybe I'm reading it wrong. 62% of our staff participated. Well, there were some campuses that showed low. Uh, so uh, my message to the campuses, I'm not going to mention them, but they're, uh, you know, uh, that tells me that you're not being part of the team type deal, you know. And it could have been, you know, I know we have a, some changing going on, but still, uh, you know, that's, that's one of the key biggest deals in our district is that adult behavior will change in order for student outcomes to change. Yes, sir. And uh, so if you could just kind of relay that message. Yes, sir. I think, I think one of the things that we have to work on is getting um, our campuses to understand the value of things that we're bringing to them that help triangulate a lot of the information from uh, what a teacher might feel what a student feels, what a principal feels, and what we may be getting um, through third party or through conversations and pulling all that data and information together. The more people who take the survey and find value in taking a survey, because we may have saturated our, our community with surveys. And so finding value in this survey and then utilizing it as an active tool, much like what Trustee Murray said, that we're able to come in and then do, do active work around the things that we're seeing. Why do students say that they feel this way? Why are teachers saying that they feel that way? Why there's, is there maybe a, a disparity between how they think about um, an aspect of, of school where teachers think high, students think low? Why are we, um, how are we infusing that into our regular campus work? I agree, the more people that take this survey, 
brings more information to the table, especially as we're hearing things from certain campuses that begin to emerge. This is another way where they can report and give us information that allows us to dive deeper. And you made reference to it. I guess another motivating factor, or hopefully a motivating factor to address these issues will be that you anticipate this type of information to be incorporated into the school performance framework criteria by which we're going to ourselves as a MISD and a community grade our campuses, if you will. Yes, sir, absolutely. And so for those that want to do well, they will, they will need to pay attention to these items as, as that will be included as part of their school performance framework criteria. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Any other questions or anything? All right. Thank you, Ms. Kale. Thank you. All right. Now turning to our discussion action item 7A, adopt the tax rate. That information is on page begins on page 303 of our board packet. Ms. Moss, welcome back. Thank you. Mr. Davis, earlier during our financial update, we discussed the tax rate and the calculations thereof. If there are no further questions in regard to that, administration recommends approval of the ordinance setting the to total tax rate for 2018-19 to $1.12, that's 1.12005. The rate for maintenance and operations is 1.04005, and the rate for interest and sinking is 0 0.08. Um, it does require a specific language uh, for the motion as well. And that language is on page 303 of our board packet. So moved. Well, you got to read it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. I move that the property tax rate be increased by the adoption of a tax rate of $1.12005 per 100 valuation, which is effectively a 9.4 increase in the tax rate. This tax rate will raise more taxes for maintenance and operation than last year's tax rate. Uh, motion by Mr. Kenny, second by Mr. Marquez. Any discussion? or further discussion than we've already had or questions that we already had. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moss. All right, next action item, 7B, approved district teaching permits. Mr. Bailey, welcome back. The information begins on page 305 of our board packet. Board President, board members, um, this action item is in accordance with uh, DBA legal policy that the district may issue a school district teaching permit and employs a teacher or person who does not hold a teaching certificate um, as permitted by Texas law for non-core academic career and technology educa technical education courses. And there are two recommendations. Move for approval. Motion by Mr. Fuller. Second by Mr. Bishop. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. It's unanimous, thank you. Next action item, 7C, approve certified appraisers for the 2018-19 school year. In accordance with local policy, the district shall appraise teachers using the Texas Teacher Evaluation and Support System, which is known as T-Test, and in accordance with law and administrative regulation. And the board um, is to approve a list of certified appraisers who can appraise a teacher in the place of the teacher supervisor, and we're presenting the entire list of certified appraisers. A question. So, is the um, the statement of appraising teacher in place of the teacher supervisor? So, is that to to help the administrator of the campus uh, process that? There's a provision to take the, to take the load off of them, or is not not necessarily. There's a provision that if a teacher has a question about their appraisal that they can actually request a second appraiser uh, appraisal by another appraiser um, and so this list they can request that they receive an appraisal from another um, certified appraiser that's been through the training oh okay any other questions motion by mr marquez second, second by mr fuller all those in favor please raise your right hand it's unanimous thank you all right, 
Again, Mr. Bailey, it's action item 7D. Unfortunately, teacher contract abandonment. One, good cause did not exist for resignation. And two, complaint and request for sanctions to TEA regarding D. Pennard. Board members, we do have um, two um, employees to present tonight that did not present just cause for resignation after um, the penalty free period. The first is uh, concerning D. Pennard. Motion by Mr. Marquez, second by Mr. Kennedy. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. It's unanimous, thank you. And next concerns the same matter. Teacher contract abandonment. Good cause did not exist for resignation and a complaint request for sanction of TEA regarding C. Richmond. Motion by Mr. Marquez. Second. Second by Mr. Fuller. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. It's unanimous. All right, next is uh, action item 7F, discussion and possible approval of order and notice of regular trustee election for districts 3, 5, and 6 for November 6, 2018. The information begins on page 321 of our board packet. What? Not, there's no presenter listed. Oh, Leah, okay. <laughs> All right. Let's see. The first, uh, the first item would be the motion. Approving the order calling the 2018 trustee election for trustee districts 3, 5, and 6. Motion by Mr. Marquez. Second by Mr. Kennedy. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. It's unanimous. Thank you. And we also, I'm not entirely sure, but I think I'd like to also us to approve the uh, early voting and election day voting locations as described on page 322 and 323 of our board packet. Motion by Mr. Kennedy, second by Mr. Marquez. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. It's unanimous, thank you. All right, next action item 7G. Application for inaugural membership into the Lone Star Governance Exemplar Cohort, page 326. I am the presenter on this one. What do we need to also regular voting day, election day? Well, well I, that was included in, okay. in what I was, yeah. And now all of those matters are also, it may have been belt and suspenders, but it's also in the resolution we're going to sign. Okay. Um, this information begins on page 326. As you know, we were among the very first school boards to go through Lone Star Governance. And we're currently ranked number one on the TA leaderboard for that. TA has recently announced that they're going to uh, accept letters of interest for school boards interested in becoming one of 12 school boards to be part of the first inaugural cohort of Lone Star Exemplar, Lone Star Governance Exemplar. Uh, it's designed for high performing local governing teams, both the school board members and superintendents that want to continue honing their intense focus on one primary objective improving student outcomes uh, requires uh, requires an application to be submitted by the end of this month it requires attendance at a Lone Star governance workshop with our fellow with all of us uh, requires monthly board board chair superintendent and implementation support a quarterly self-evaluation support which we already do each quarter 
Uh, we need, it requires all statutorily required board member trainings, which we do already. Uh, and it helps support district level distinction and exemplary governance on the A through F report card and, and the Texas Academic Performance ro Report. Also gives us early access to Lone Star Campus and discipline trainings. And it also allows us to collaborate, learn from, and help and perhaps help others, other school boards be high performing. Uh, I would recommend that we uh, make this application and dedicate ourselves to this effort. Motion by Mr. Kennedy, second by Mr. Bishop. I, uh, Any just want questions? To just want to comment that uh, um, I said it earlier, but Long Star Governance has been an uh, uh, awesome guiding tool. And uh, uh, the sole goal of it uh, is to improve student outcomes. And uh, so uh, they're improving. And, and we look forward to uh, continuing doing the work. And I'm extremely proud to be part of this board because uh, of this work. And uh, so I'd like to thank all my board members for putting in the time to uh, through go through go through this work and obviously also the district um, for putting their time in and influence and uh, and guidance also as to how to guide some of this work so it's a team effort but I'm extremely proud that that uh, I'm part of uh, this work it's uh, it's really amazing that we're here in Midland are leading uh, probably the state and uh, probably uh, our surrounding states so just extremely proud about about that work so all right thank you mr. mr. Riddick since our vote to approve includes including you are you have anything to add to the comment the discussion on it mr. Riddick we're, I'm glad that we're pursuing this and moving down this pathway and conversations with A.J. Krebel, uh, Deputy Commissioner for the Texas Education Agency. He values the work that we're putting in and it's continuous work of what we're already doing and to show ourselves as an exemplar uh, pushes us even further. It sets up the standards that we want to do with a workshop to go through the year's work to assess uh, where we are around our general our goal progress measures and our constraint progress measures as well it pushes us even further along so I, I'm glad we're going down this pathway all right any other questions or comments all right ready for the vote all those in favor please raise your right hand it's unanimous thank you mr. Riddick I will I will uh, attempt to fill out the application as best I can and send you my best efforts and then uh, if there are any blanks I'd ask you to help me fill them in and then we'll turn it in timely. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, it is now um, 8.17 p.m. and we'll now go into closed session in accordance with government code sections 551.001 551.071 through 0 0.074, 0 0.076, 0 0.0821 through 0 0.084. Thank you very much. It is 11.08 p.m. and we are emerging from closed session to take up the next, to take up uh, action item Number nine, action arising from closed session. 9A, superintendent evaluation. Mr. Kennedy. I'd like to move that we extend uh, Mr. Riddick's contract for another year on top of the two that are remaining. Uh, All right, motion by Mr. Kennedy. Second. Second by Mr. Marquez. Uh, any discussion or questions? 
All right, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. It's unanimous. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Riddick. All right, well, it is now 11.09 p.m., and we are adjourned. Thank you.